Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. My name is LaToya Baldwin Clark. I am an assistant professor at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles School of Law. I was also the Earl B. Dickerson Fellow at the University of Chicago Law School in 2016 to 2018. I am pleased to be moderating this panel on the civil rights lawyer with Professor Kenneth Mack and Professor Sean Ose Owusu. Let me first introduce Professor Mack. So Professor Mack is the Lawrence D. Beale Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, as well as an affiliate professor of history at Harvard University. He is also the co-faculty leader of the Harvard Law School Program on Law and History. His 2012 book, Representing the Wraith, the Creation of Civil Rights, of, of the Civil Rights Lawyer, was a Washington Post Best Book of the Year, a National Book Festival selection, was awarded honorable mention for the J. Willard Hurst Award by the Law and Society Association, and was a finalist for the Julia Ward Howe Book Award. He is also the co-editor of The New Black, What Has Changed and What Has Not with Race in America, in 2016 to 2017, he was a Radcliffe Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. He is currently working on a book project that examines the social and political history of race and political economy in the United States after 1975. Professor John Osei Owusu is the Presidential Assistant Professor of Law at Penn Law. He is an interdisciplinary legal scholar with expertise in legal history criminal law and procedure, civil rights, and the legal profession. His work sits at the intersection of law, history, and sociology, and focuses on how governments meet their legal obligation to provide services and benefits to poor people and racial minorities. He also works on stratification and legal education in the legal profession. He has received awards from social science and humanities organizations, such as the American Bar Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Science Foundation. His book project, The People's Champ, Legal Aid from Slavery to Mass Incarceration, is under contract with Harvard University Press. The book uses archival research, court documents, oral histories, and interviews to highlight the role of legal aid organizations in longstanding struggles for racial justice. He is also one of this year's 10 New America National Fellows. So as in the other panels, both presenters will have between 20 and 25 minutes to make their remarks. After that, we will have question and answer. Please feel free to use the hand raising function in uh, Zoom, or you can send your question to me in the chat, uh, Latoya Baldwin-Clark. Uh, so we'll start with Professor Mack. Okay. Um, <clears throat> First, uh, thank you to Dean McAd McAdams for inviting me. Um, when I got the invitation some time ago, it was, uh, it was a pleasure and it was an honor. Uh, it's particularly a pleasure and honor to commemorate the centennial of Earl Dickerson's graduation from the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, I spent perhaps 15 years of my life researching and writing about African-American civil rights lawyers. And Dickerson is one of the figures who intrigued me from the start. I always wanted to know more about him. Um, over the course of my research, I found out more about him, but uh, there's more to explore uh, and more ways in which uh, Dickerson can be emblematic of larger trends that scholars and others should explore. So I'm happy to be um, part of this conference. Uh, now we've heard about a lot about Dickerson today um, in many ways, Dickerson was what, what's, what was known as the Dean of Chicago's Black Bar. Um, he was the most prominent among a bar that included the largest grouping of black lawyers in the United States. The most, Chicago was the city that had the most black lawyers. Uh, a group that included figures such as Irvin Mollison, another University of Chicago graduate who would become the first black judge on the US Customs Court. Truman Gibson, another University of Chicago graduate who would become a member of FDR's black cabinet and go on to an illustrious career that would see him represent people like Joe Lewis. Um, and figures like 
William Ming, uh, Bob Ming, another University of Chicago graduate who would later become the first black law professor to teach at a white law school, the University of Chicago, and who among other things was responsible for saving the career of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, when King was accused of tax evasion. Now, all these lawyers were products of a particular moment in the history and of the particular so sociology of race in Chicago, which allowed a black lawyer to move back and forth seamlessly from practicing law uh, into politics and into business with ease. And allowed lawyers like Dickerson to do it within a predominantly African-American social structure. For there had been a previous generation of black lawyers in Chicago who included figures such as Edward, the pioneering black lawyer, Edward Morris, uh, who in his own time was regarded as the dean of the city's black bar and the pioneering black woman lawyer, uh, Ida Platt. But for this previous generation of black lawyers, being a representative of black people at the bar meant representing white people as one's clients. Um, many black lawyers of this generation predominantly rep rep represented white clients and um, Morris and Platt were no exception. Both Morris and Platt were both light skinned uh, in addition to representing a predominantly white clientele. And indeed Platt eventually passed for white and slipped out of the collective consciousness of the city's black community who had earlier celebrated her career. Yet each of these figures, Morris and Platt, were embraced as representatives of Chicago's black community in the generation before Dickerson. Figures who were emblematic of the community's aspirations and desires, precisely because they could move through a predominantly white world of professional life. Now, Dickerson was different and his generation was different. What made Dickerson and figures such as Mollison, Gibson, and to a much lesser extent, Bob Ming, representatives of Chicago's Black community, was their ability to seamlessly traverse the worlds of law, politics, and business by relying on the clientele, votes, and patronage of Black people rather than white people. They all took advantage of the prestige that came from their ability to attend um, an elite white law school like the University of Chicago, rather than the night schools where Chicago's lawyers typically earn their degrees. But Dickerson was, he was called the Dean of Chicago's Black Bar because he was able to do this, traverse one domain of professional life and another and another and another to do this better than his contemporaries at the Black Bar. He became more prominent. Dickerson represented Black Chicagoans as legal clients, as political constituents, uh, he was elect, an elected official, and as business patrons. And he represented their aspirations. He literally stood in for his fellow African Americans who lived their lives behind a veil that separated them from most whites. And he did this better than any Chicago Black lawyer of his era. But why was this so? What made Dickerson distinctive, both distinctive within the Chicago Black Bar and actually distinctive from many of his prominent fellow Black attorneys around the country? I'd like to explore some possible answers to that question in my remaining time. What made Dickerson into such a prominent representative of his race? I'd like to start by what distinguished him from most prominent African-American civil rights lawyers of his era. Lawyers who practiced in places like Los Angeles, Washington, DC, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Um, what distinguished Dickerson was that with one or two notable exceptions, he didn't make his reputation in court. The things that made his reputation with one notable exception, the uh, Hansberry versus Lee, um, were things that happened outside the court. So that distinguished Dickerson from his black lawyer colleagues. So to situate Dickerson in his place and time, I'd like to talk just a little bit about what it meant to be an African-American lawyer in the era of segregation. Um, first, and, and first what it really meant, the thing that really distinguished one is that most 
black lawyers who became prominent national figures made their livings more often than not by going to court. So I'll start a little bit with the role of law. Um, I'll start with the institution of law that was most important to most black lawyers who became prominent in Dickerson's era, the courts. Now, if we turn our clock back, you know, about 80 or 90 years, a um, hundred years or so to the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, American race relations, of course, were at their nadir. In the South, African-Americans can't vote, they can't hold most jobs, um, and can't appear in almost any public place where they can mix with whites and be addressed as equals. And even in places like Earl Dickerson, Chicago, places like schools were segregated. It could be hard to get served in restaurants downtown. African-Americans, of course, were making inroads in business and politics in the 1920s. But really, they were doing this by doing it within segregated spaces to which they were confined. But courtrooms were different. Courtrooms played a unique role as segregation began to be extended to northern cities in the early 20th century because these were places where racial boundaries were crossed. The professional ethos of the legal profession and aspirational ethos to be, get to, to be sure was that there was only one kind of lawyer. Everyone was treated equally in court, formally at least. Of course, there were many, many inequalities that black lawyers had to suffer in the courtroom, but there was only one court system. Courts were public spaces in an era of segregation defined by the constriction of public space, the inability of African-Americans and whites to mix in the same public spaces. Even in the North, um, civil rights movement will coalesce around segregation in theaters, schools, and later employment, um, where Black people pushed back against segregation in cities like Chicago were precisely in those kinds of public spaces where Blacks and whites would interact, uh, might interact as relative equals. And in an era of segregation, in fact, Black lawyers appeared in the courts every day, which was quite distinctive from what they did in any other place. This was an era that was defined by segregation of professional space for lawyers as well as others. In cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and Boston, the prior generation of black lawyers had often made their livings by representing white clients. Many of them in places like Cleveland, for instance, had their offices in the same district as white lawyers. But even Edward Morris, who later served as a mentor of sorts to Dickerson, was, was the last of the generation who could do this. From the 1920s on, being a black lawyer meant that you had to make your reputation with black clients, and more often than not, you made it by going to court. In fact, things happened in court that simply didn't happen in other places. Take, for example, Philadelphia lawyer Raymond Pace Alexander. Reading a trial transcript of the 1940s, we see Alexander examining a police detective in a case. And the police detective answers him, yes, sir, no, sir. They didn't find anything there, Mr. Alexander. But a hundred feet away, Alexander will be struggled to be served a sandwich anywhere in downtown Philadelphia, while the white detective could use most public spaces as a matter of course. Things happen in court that didn't happen in other places. In a segregated world, race and racial identity were defined by one's treatment in public spaces. Um, where general population came together and interacted socially, but courts were different than other public spaces. There was only one kind of lawyer, formally at least, and there every lawyer was supposed to be treated equally. Now, what I'm talking about is formal equality, forms of address, patterns of deference, and professional acts dictated by a script that applied to being a lawyer in the courtroom. Lawyers followed a informal script about what happened in the courtroom. And black lawyers like Raymond Pace Alexander, Charles Houston, and Thurgood Marshall use that script to get white people to treat them like no black person would be treated in any other public space. In fact, Thurgood Marshall carried these lessons through to his entire career. 
For example, in the Brown versus Board of Education litigation, when it reached the Supreme Court, Marshall co provoked complaints from the NAACP staff for going out to lunch with his opposing lawyer, a patrician white Southerner named John W. Davis. Robert Carter, Marshall's principal deputy at the NAACP, was dumbfounded in his early years at the NAACP. Marshall would always joke and exchange pleasantries with the white lawyers who were defending segregation. And in fact, during the first and second Supreme Court arguments in Brown, Marshall and John W. Davis sat beside one another, exchanged jokes and pleasantries. People like Carter struggled to figure out what was Marshall doing? Well, Marshall was doing this because Davis was a segregationist. His opponent, John W. Davis, privately insisted on what he called the anatomical and the intellectual differences between black people and white people that justified segregation. So, you know, what Marshall is doing is he's using the script, the glue of professional identity that held courtroom lawyers together with regardless, with regardless of race to make a point that the script that attached to his identity as a lawyer was a powerful way to make a segregationist white Southerner interact with him in, as an equal in public. Now, outside the court processes, of course, someone like Davis would have never interacted with Marshall in public space, but the courtroom made everything different. In fact, Thurgood Marshall's approach to his interaction with John W. Davis grew out of his early years in practice in Baltimore, where he likewise built up a professional relationships through repeat encounters with the same opponents over time in the courtrooms of rural Maryland. Marshall made his reputation as a lawyer. He put himself on the path to becoming the Thurgood Marshall that we know and recognize through these early courtroom interactions. In fact, a young Marshall would write back approvingly to his superiors in his early NAACP cases that he was, quote, given every courtesy, courtesy, close quote, by local whites when he arrived um, in a local place for a case, cases that ranged from interracial rape prosecutions to school desegregation lawsuits. Over time, Marshall used his repeat encounters with his lawyer's opponents to learn to stick to the script that attached to legal proceedings. Marshall would be given the formal courtesy given any other lawyer, except that they didn't call him Mr. They wouldn't call him Mr. Marshall, even in counties that hadn't seen a black lawyer in over a generation. But in turn, Marshall's presence as a complete and equal member of the legal fraternity attested to the fairness or unfairness of the proceedings before him. If Marshall said a proceeding was fair, local authorities could prosecute black defendants in the most racially divisive cases without fear of being, being accused of discrimination by their local black communities. But at the same token, Marshall's presence sometimes enabled local authorities to come to verdicts that would otherwise seem unlikely given the racial realities of the time. Sometimes Marshall would win cases involving things like police brutality just because of his mere presence and his ability to get white lawyers and judges to stick to the script. Well, this was a world that was completely alien to Earl Dickerson, uh, as I'm going to explain in a moment. In the early 20th century, black lawyers imagined courtrooms as a public space where racial identification slipped their ordinary bounds. In a courtroom, a black man or occasionally a black woman could demand and receive treatment nearly unlike that uh, of any, any black person that could receive in any other public space. And through repeat encounters with the same opponents and allies, the public space of the courtroom cemented black lawyers into a legal profession that appeared to cross racial lines, at least within some limit. Now, um, this was in measure a, a script. It was a, a, a script that allowed black lawyers to get certain forms of courtesy. Although it was far more complicated than what has often been described by current activists as the politics of respectability, because it also allowed black lawyers to confront and cooperate at the same time. Because in truth, many of the civil rights lawyer cases that civil rights lawyers brought, both in the South 
And in many parts of the North and in the Midwest, they were dangerous. And interracial rape cases could be dangerous. Many black lawyers were attacked when they exited the courtroom. But at the same time, these were confrontations that occurred on a plane that had rules and had a script. And these lawyers were folded into what I call the fraternity of lawyers. Now, the key to the particular mode of racial representation that Earl Dickerson developed was that he broke from just about everything that I've just described. He broke from this mode of practice almost from the moment he became a lawyer. Not long after taking his law degree from the University of Chicago, Dickerson set up shop with Edward Morris, who in addition to being the Dean of the Chicago Black Bar, had helped educate a number of his fellow black lawyers in the practice of law and the techniques to get clients. Indeed, Morris's reputation was so widespread that about a decade earlier, an aspiring Howard Law graduate named William LaPrey Houston had moved all the way from Washington, D.C. to Chicago just to learn the practice of law from Morris before returning home to set up his own firm, where his own son, a lawyer named Charles Hamilton Houston, who would go on to become the NAACP's chief lawyer, eventually set up shop. Indeed, um, Dickerson chose wisely in practicing with Morris at the beginning of his career. Um, because if he'd stayed in Morris's law firm, perhaps he would have translated his mentor's example into a world of the 1920s and become an adept courtroom lawyer. But other opportunities soon presented themselves to Dickerson and he would make his career in the two other domains that would define him, public life and business. In particular, Dickerson's political connections soon got him a job as an assistant corporation counsel and later as an assistant attorney general. And what really saved Dickerson's career was a chance encounter that resulted in him becoming general counsel to the Liberty Life Insurance Company, later renamed Su Supreme Liberty Life. In neither his public life nor in his business practice would Dickerson develop the careful courtroom-based identity that many of his fellow black lawyers had cultivated. Indeed, it showed in his most famous case, the racially restrictive covenant case of Hansberry versus Lee. In that case, Dickerson did not represent Carl and Nanny Hansberry. That role was taken up by Dick Dickerson's fellow Chicago black lawyer, C. Francis Stratford. Dickerson was in the case representing Supreme Liberty, which held a mortgage on the Hansberry's house. The case also showed off a particular trait that very much distinguished Dickerson from many of his fellow Black lawyers, his direct and quite confrontational style with white people. In fact, Dickerson asked a question at the Hansberry trial of one witness that would have left most Black lawyers aghast. He asked one witness, quote, are you a member of the Ku Klux Klan?" Close quote. It was a rhetorical question, of course. Dickerson was a fierce advocate for the things he believed in. He wasn't afraid to confront and embarrass his opponents in service of his objectives. It allowed him to accomplish things, such as when President Roosevelt appointed him to the sixth mem member FEPC, the Fair Employment Practices Committee during World War II. It was Dickerson who pushed the FEPC to become something other than a two-slits entity with no enforcement powers. Indeed, Dickerson was the dominant figure in the FEPC in its early years. He was the one who convinced his colleagues to interpret their vague mandate as a commission to hold public hearings where labor and industry leaders were subject to intense grilling on their hiring of minority workers. Indeed, according to one history of the FEPC, Dickerson, quote, pressed witnesses with a determined single-mindedness and a copious time-consuming reiteration, close quote, of his points. Dickerson himself would recall, later recall that, quote, I was more aggressive than ever in my life in those days. Indeed, he pursued his project at times with a near, near suicidal zeal, such as when he insisted that the committee hold hearings in Birmingham, Alabama, and on traveling there himself, a black man, to engage in his usual confrontational tactics with white witnesses. Indeed, there was so much fear for Dickerson's safety 
that when he exited the airport, airport in Birmingham, a six foot four inch federal marshal met him to protect him from violence. In fact, when the FEPC was reorganized in 1943, President Roosevelt deliberately chose to appoint the conservative Norfolk, Virginia newspaper publisher P.B. Young rather than Dickerson as the African-American representative on the committee. Dickerson perhaps had been a bit too confrontational. But indeed, it was this, this kind of passion, this kind of thirst for confrontation, as well as de his devotion to progressive politics and integration that sustained Dickerson through the years, uh, which Chris Schmidt has just chronicled, in which his um, leadership of the National Lawyers Guild occurred at the height of the Cold War in the rare Red Scare. Only someone who had a thirst for confrontation would want to do such a thing. But there was a flip side to Dickerson's confrontational approach to advocacy that developed uh, to the, the thing that made the core of his professional identity, this confrontational approach to advocacy, there's a flip side to it. Dickerson spent little of his career being disciplined by the everyday practice of lawyer-client interactions that it profoundly shaped the careers of lawyers such as Marshall, Lauren Miller, and Philadelphia Sadie Alexander. He was a bit of a free spirit, determined to go his own way. And indeed that proved fatal in the other domain in which Dickerson sought to traverse that of politics and public life. In 1939, Dickerson won election to become the first Democrat to represent Chicago's second ward as an alderman, but he was ousted from that position only a few years later. In 1942, Dickerson chose to run in the Democratic primary for the first Illinois congressional district on the south side of Chicago. Now, of course, this was and is a historic district. The first African-American to be elected to Congress from the North, Oscar de Priest, had won that district as a Republican. And many years later, a young state senator named Barack Obama would run and lose an election to represent it. Now, Dickerson's principal opponent in that campaign for the first congressional district was a Democratic committeeman named William Dawson. Dawson would win his primary against Dickerson by exploiting his opponent's perceived lack of connection to everyday voters in the district. His supporters, Dawson supporters called Dickerson, quote, a silk stocking, quote, and a quote, high hat. They spread rumors that he was married to a white woman. In fact, Dickerson and his wife were both actually quite light skinned. Dickerson was a proud and aggressive New Dealer. He was in the course of establishing a national represent, reputation for his willingness to confront whites in order to gain resources for blacks. But he also had a reputation for being a bit disconnected from his community, for spending too much time in these integrated venues where he confronted whites. He would soon lose his aldermanic seat as well in the next election. And while his career in law and business would continue for decades, his role as a figure in Chicago politics was finished. So Dickerson's particular approach to representation, his confrontational style with whites, his free spiritedness was in fact augmented by the fact that the things that shaped Dickerson's career were actually slightly different than the things that shaped the careers of lawyers like Thurgood Marshall, Sadie Alexander, Lauren Miller, Raymond Pace Alexander, and Charles Houston. Dickerson's confrontational style developed outside of the discipline of the everyday practice of law. It had its benefits, and indeed, um, you know, one of the benefits was that he became a national figure. He pushed the FEPC to do things it wouldn't have otherwise done. He got resources from blacks for blacks and he confronted whites, but there were costs as well. And I think that style with its benefits and its costs can be traced to many sources, but one of which was Dickerson's particular professional route to practice, which separated him from his prominent black lawyer colleagues. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Oseowusu.
Great. So I have a PowerPoint um, that I'm going to put. Would you like to? Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. I have a PowerPoint that I am going to play. Let's get this set up. Wait, can people see? Yikes. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the doubly unenviable task of going last in what has been a great day of conversations uh, and discussions and um, presenting uh, after Ken Mack or with Ken Mack, who's a leading scholar of race and the history of the legal profession and whose thinking has influenced my thinking on some of the issues uh, that we've discussed today. Um, so it's a doubly unenviable task, but Nevertheless, the show must go on. Uh, so I want to just uh, quickly thank um, William and Richard for inviting me to talk about the life of Earl Dickerson, uh, as well as the other organizers of the conference. So in their 1945 study of Chicago Black metropolis, St. Clair Drake and Horace Caton incisively describe the kind of racial sentiment of the city's south side and the different archetypes of racial being. So race leaders, they suggest, are quote, expected to put up some sort of aggressive fight against the exclusion and subordination of Negroes, quote. Noting that there's widespread, widespread um, disagreement about what constitutes a race leader, they, did, they describe it, they describe sincerity as a cardinal vote virtue. And they enumerate a list of sincerity related characteristics that are identified by black people in the South Side. Uh, so some of these include uh, a race leader, quote, knows the difficulties of the race and fights without a selfish reason. A race leader is a sincere person with some moral principle. A race leader is sincere and has a plan. A race leader has a constant sincere interest in the race. A race leader is sincere and people know he is not after some hidden personal interest. A race leader has the interest and well being of the Negro race uppermost in his life. So, part of what I want to do today is show how Dickerson captured the essence of some of these ideas of race leadership. So uh, this is one of the many fascinating images I've come across uh, in Dickerson's collections at the Vivian Hirsch Library on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and this one in particular is one that someone drew up for the 1961 NAACP convention that year. And my discussion today is going to situate the career of Earl Dickerson within uh, this framework of race leadership by, foc by, by co focusing on his various legal, political, business, uh, and, and civic work. And so many of Dickerson's independent accolades are impressive, but his leadership across different domains, so as chair of FEPC, president of the National Bar Association, Bar Association National Lawyers Guild, Cap Alpha Psi, his work with the American Legion, uh, as Southside Alderman, as president of the Supreme Life Insurance Company. These positions evince a unique kind of racial leadership that I think is important to note. 
it's akin to the ways that Ken in his own work has encouraged legal historians to not focus exclusively on litigation based approaches when it comes to civil rights, but instead to think more capaciously about the ways black attorneys address the issues of legally sanctioned racial inequality and racial uplift. So the first organization that I wanna talk about that Mr. Dickinson was involved in is African-American Fraternity Kappa Alpha Psi, which Sherrod Thaxon talked about earlier today and, noticed, and noted that Dickerson's statement that the organization did the most for him socially. So like Sherrod, I learned about Mr. Dickerson long before I started my legal career in the spring of 2006 when I became a member of the organization's Theta chapter at Northwestern, which was established in 1917 and was one of the few chapters in the Midwest. Dickerson played an influential role in the development of the organization. So now Greek life is something that looks different based on the organization itself, geography, the school that the fraternity or sorority is linked to, and the time period that we're talking about. Um, and I think that's particularly the case for African-American Greek organizations. And there are some contemporary iterations that understand Greek organizations as, as social clubs premised on certain kinds of ideas about brotherhood and sisterhood, as well as civic participation. And so that's the case now and has been the case historically. But I think it's easy to lose sight of the importance of these organizations during the period in which they cropped up, as well as simply not grasp the racial milieu that played a role in their creation. So this was, as David Strauss pointed to in his presentation, the nadir of race relations. This is a moment where the few black college students who were on campuses experienced extreme social ostracism, where they were excluded from white Greek organizations, oftentimes couldn't eat or study in the same places as white students, struggled to find meeting places. And so the members of this organization banded together in an, eff in an, in an uh, effort to emphasize brotherhood, achievement, civic activism, and racial uplift. Dickerson was a charter member of the second undergraduate chapter, the beta chapter at the University of Illinois, which was founded in February, 1913. He would go on to become a charter member of the Chicago alumni chapter, which was founded in April, 1919. And so here's a picture and, and you can see him here in the kind of center middle left. And he would go on to be the fifth grand pole mark, which is the equivalent to the president of the organization in 1927. And as Sherrod laid out in his uh, presentation, Dickerson influenced the work of later members many of whom would become attorneys uh, and legal advocates for racial justice on their own terms. And he would be central figure in many of the narratives of the organizations. And at this point, I'd like to say, I think for people who are interested in the legal advocacy of African-American Greek organizations, I suggest the work uh, of Gregory Parks, who's arguably the leading expert on this issue. Next, I wanna talk about liberty life and supreme liberty. So this is a picture from a profile of the organization that was written up in Ebony in 1971. Again, as many people have mentioned today, Dickerson had trouble getting a law firm job after law school, notwithstanding recommendations from James Parker Hall and Ernest Foyne. So he took a job at Liberty Life Insurance Company. Given Dickerson's many impressive political and legal accomplishments, it's easy to lose sight of what his primary work was. So the Supreme Life Insurance Company was originally incorporated as the Liberty Life Insurance Company in June, 1919. And by 1969, it was the third largest black life insurance firm in the country with assets of more than $33 million. So it's important to note again, the economic context in which some of this work was occurring. This is a moment where African-Americans were 
excluded from and or unattended to by the insurance industry. And although the black population grew during the second great migration, this was a population of people that worked primarily low income jobs um, as opposed to skilled jobs uh, and some worked semi-skilled jobs. And in some ways, while Liberty, which was led by Dick Dickerson, met a unique market, it was in some ways an economically marginalized and precarious market. And so there are a handful of articles in business history that discuss Dickerson's work, particularly his work in helping expand the organization through various acquisitions, helping the organization survive economic uncertainties, and his role in helping emphasize ordinary life insurance policies as opposed to just industrial policies, to name a few. Uh, and what also appears in some of this literature is the belief that economic inequality was an essential component to racial equality, excuse me, economic equality was an essential component to racial equality. But to the extent that there's more literature on Dickerson to be written, I think this would be a particularly fruitful area of inquiry. There's of course something to be said about Dickerson's work in the legal profession, much of which was discussed today um, and most notably uh, his unique role in Hansberry versus Lee, which helped pave the way for Shelley versus Kramer. But I think there's something special about the network of black attorneys that Earl Dickerson was a part of and his leadership roles in various organizations. Most notably, he was on the board, uh, the national board of the NAACP from 1941 to 1971. He was the president of the National Bar Association, which was founded in 1925 and was a national network of mostly black attorneys, which was a response to the ABA's exclusion of black attorneys. And he served as president from 1945 to 1947. He was the president of the National Lawyers Guild, which Chris Schmidt discussed earlier today, which also emerged not only as a racially integrated alternative to the ABA, but also as the more progressive alternative to the ABA which at the time had a fairly conservative anti-New Deal reputation. So he was at the helm of this organization during the height of anti-communism. He was a member of the Cook County Bar Association, which was founded in 1914. And again, was created in part because of the Chicago Bar Association and its white members rejection of the application of black attorneys. And so he was the president of the CCBA in 1938 and 1939. And here I want to note some comments that he offered in his inaugural address in 1939. So he noted, quote, it is unreasonable that a bar association, and here he's talking about the Illinois Bar Association, it's unreasonable that a bar association that passes on the character and fitness of everyone who practices law in the state that has the power to approve and disapprove candidates for the judiciary and other high legal offices that can discipline any member of the bar. It is unreasonable that this body should deny membership to a significant segment of the legal profession representing a significant segment of the people of Illinois. I think this quote which comes from Robert Blakely's book on Dickerson, captures some of his thinking on the ways that Dickerson believed that diversifying the bar and supporting Black attorneys was crucial to racial justice. And so this version of legal advocacy actualized through his leadership in various organizations and not through the more recognizable method of litigation as, as Kent discussed, but through a certain kind of institution building and guiding that I think is subtle but powerful, I think it's particularly important in a world where we're still trying to figure out questions of diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. 
Now, I could go on and continue discussing some of Dickerson's work and other organizations, such as the American Legion, the Urban League, the Burr Oak Cemetery Association. But I'll stop here and simply offer that those citations, but also emphasize what I hope has not only been gleaned from this talk, but from all the presentations today. And that is that this was an ordinary, extraordinary person who used a variety of avenues, civic, political, legal, and economic, in search of racial justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you. Um, just a reminder to, you can raise your hand or send me a uh, question. Um, I will kind of start off because one thing I was so intrigued by what both of you said, and actually I think it has um, some lessons for our students, um, is the idea that Black lawyers can be lots of different things and work in different domains in order to be, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, Sean was saying as being a race leader. Um, and I was just really intrigued about how he, even in this panel, we're talking about him as a civil rights lawyer, but you guys are really talking about how he was a civil rights person, right? He championed civil rights in his business, also in his, um, in politics, as well as in his lawyering. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more uh, about that, about his leadership, um, not just as a lawyer, and maybe also what are the lessons um, that our students can take from that. Students who came to law school saying, I'm coming to law school because I wanna you know, do good things for my people. Um, but we have here someone who was not only a lawyer, but also worked in many other domains. Uh, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, my kind of immediate reaction to your, to your uh, question uh, in terms of the kinds of lessons is, the ways that um, you know, I, th I think Dickerson's work is impressive because he's working across different domains, but there's a certain kind of necessity to it. Uh, when I think about it, I think about it in terms of three ways. The first is just like economic necessity, like he couldn't get a law firm job. And you know, there are moments in recent history where you know, um, the nature of the, uh, of the legal economy funnels people toward certain kind of work. So there's the, the kind of economic necessity. Um, I think there's a, I think tied to it is the, 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 the kind of um, multiple approaches that racial justice demand. Um, and so this, that kind of kind of bleeds to the point that I was making that, that Ken has emphasized in his work. And so, you know, historically we tend to look at, we tend to look at, um, civil rights primarily through the lens of litigation. I, I think until Ken's important work has nudged us to think more expansively. And I think we could say the same thing to our students when they imagine what their legal careers will look like. Um, and part of that is just tied to the fact that, you know, m many of our law schools want our students to go become practicing attorneys, um, but it's not necessarily the only way to effectuate legal change. Um, and then that becomes tricky because, you know, one sense we, we want our students to be employed for a variety of reasons, but we also want them to chase, you know, their professional dreams to follow their social justice commitments. And so I think a lesson there would be le kind of legal change doesn't only occur through courts. And um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I didn't see Jerry Rosenberg uh, on uh, on the conference, but I'm sure that's something that that he would agree with as well. Surely, uh, Professor Mack, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. You know, I would uh, first endorse what Sean just said, which you know, and I think that that kind of builds on the points that both Chris Schmidt and uh, Dylan Penningroth were making in the previous panel that that you know, civil rights is a really capacious concept. Uh, we should think of the practice of law for a lawyer interested broadly in civil rights or social justice as a very capacious concept. Uh, Dickerson thought about it that way, maybe out of necessity, as Sean has uh, indicated, right? He can't get a job in a regular law firm. He practices with Morris, but Morris has his own thing going on. Um, so that's not going to be a long-term um, 
solution. And so Dickerson kind of traverses all these realms, you know, practicing law, politics, business, and he's just kind of going back and forth. And there's something about the unique structure of Chicago that day or in that moment that kind of facilitates that. But I think that's a, that's a nice model to, to think about for um, what somebody interested in civil rights in, in the broad sense that we've been talking about or social justice uh, should think about um, the opportunities uh, available for a lawyer. Great, thank you. I'm gonna combine two questions that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, and this is about um, one kind of the more contemporary things we're talking about. And I'm wondering how you think or look at in this. So the first is about uh, women attorneys. To what extent was he a champion or what extent did he um, make room in his practice for making things um, accessible for female attorneys? Um, and then also the <laughs> Or the Republican Party, which is a question um, that we got from the chat. And I, I say that these two are a bit related, one, given just the current moment that we are in right now, the issue of intersectionality, as well as the issue of political um, divisions and political, um, the way people are thinking about politics at the moment. Could you, could you repeat the second question? I don't know if it was just me, but you went in and out a little bit. It might have just been my computer. Yeah, no worries. Um, the second question is about when he moved to the Republican Party from being a Democrat to a Republican. Um, and I'm not aware of this woman, but the question is about Jewel LaFontaine, um, whether he knew her, did she play any particular role in moving him um, towards the, uh, the more conservative side of American politics? So I don't, I mean, I'll take a stab. I, I, certainly don't have the answer to the second question. Um, I'm not sure. And I, I think in the context of the first question, um, I, haven't, I haven't come across um, anything in, in my reading of Dickerson's work, which is certainly not extensive, about, um, about um, kind of like creating space for women attorneys. But that just might be a failure of scholarly investigation and not necessarily um, the nature of his practice. I haven't come across anything, but I think it speaks to kind of the need um, for more research on African-American women attorneys, women attorneys more generally, African-American women attorneys. You know, Pauli Murray kind of um, occupies much of the space in the literature as well as Sadie Alexander. Um, but I suspect that there might be more there, but I, I haven't come across anything in particular, but you know, Certainly, Ken's been working on this longer than I have, so maybe he might have seen something. Yeah, I um, I don't know a lot about uh, Dickerson and women lawyers. Um, there are not a lot of you know that let's say black women lawyers. There's not a lot of black women lawyers in that time and period. Um, really, the only one who's really kind of traversing a lot of those same. There's kind of two who are traversing those, those same domains. Sean's already uh, mentioned them, Pauli Murray and Sadie Alexander. Dickerson certainly knew um, Sadie Alexander. Um, they were both active in the National Bar Association together. Um, but, but beyond that, I, I can't say. But again, you know, we, we need more scholarship and um, there's a lot of things we don't know about Dickerson. Many, many things we don't know about uh, both intersectionality within the bar and uh, history of black women lawyers. Um, so we need more research. Uh, Jewel Lafont, Jewel Stratford Lafont, I think it's Lafontaine. Um, she is the daughter of C. Francis Stratford, um, who was Dickerson's co-counsel in Hansbury versus Lee. Uh, she was a Republican. Um, you know, as everybody knows, you know, the traditional party for African-Americans was a Republican party. Uh, Oscar de Priest, you know, the first black congressman is elected as a Republican. Uh, there's, a, there's a long and kind of venerated uh, Republican tradition of black politics in Chicago. Um, I don't know a lot about La Fontaine. Um, her son is um, John Rogers, uh, who's the president of Ariel Capital in Chicago, you know, very prominent guy. Um, but again, we need to know more. Um, and um, 
you know, Dickerson, Republican Party, Dickerson was pretty much on the left, I think, his, almost his entire career. You know, he, um, he doesn't get a job in the Kennedy administration in part because he's kind of seen as this radioactive figure because of his popular front connections. So, you know, he's a complicated guy, but I think his politics remain fairly um, steady, certainly until pretty late in his career, at least the, part, the parts of his career that I know. Thank you. I'm going to- Just, um, just oh. to add to that before I just thought about this, I know um, Tamiko brown Nagan's working on a book on Constance Baker Motley, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so there might be some clues uh, in that work when it comes out in terms of uh, Black women attorneys. Awesome. So we have a lot of questions. I want to move from some of the questions in the chat to let some people with their hands up. So could I get Sherrod and then Adam? Uh, thank you, Professor Baldwin Clark. Uh, so uh, my question, I'll direct it first at Professor Osewusu, but uh, Professor Mack, uh, feel free to, to chime in if, if you would like. Um, and my question actually brings in part of Professor uh, Abubba's question after my presentation. Uh, and my question does have to deal with multi-party leadership, uh, let's say in its current manifestation. So when I think of, in my mind, our, our kind of modern day uh, Earl B. Dickerson with respect to multi-party uh, leadership, um, I think of Robert L. Harris, who Professor Osei Wusu might be uh, familiar with. So uh, uh, Bob Harris um, was an only national president of Kappa Alpha Psi. He was also the national president of the uh, National Bar Association, as well as the national president of um, Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, which is another uh, uh, black Greek letter organization, but it's not an undergraduate uh, organization. It's a graduate level organization. It's actually even uh, the oldest. Uh, also Harris was a founding member of the California Association of Black Lawyers. Um, well, one thing I've kind of noticed for lack of a better term is although his multi uh, organization leadership, maybe one could categorize it as, as, as more hierarchical or more um, or narrower with respect to how these different organizations are structured and their relationships where um, uh, Brother Dickerson seemed a bit, a, bit, a bit broader. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts with respect to kind of maybe this evolution or this, this current manifestation of, of multi-party leadership and what implications might that have uh, for social and racial justice work? Sure. Um, so I, my guess would be, I mean, I think it's, um, I think what makes it tricky is that there, there are way more organizations now than there were at than there were during the time that um, uh, Mr. Dickerson was at the helm of some of these organizations. I think you know, my inclination is to say that, like, you know, one version of it is like a certain kind of concern that I think we just see in the white collar professions, irrespective of race, a concern about kind of. Um, ladder climbing or credential acquired, like credential acquisition. So that's that, I'm, I'm less concerned about that, but that's always, there's always a specter of that. My sense, my or my guess, excuse me, is that, you know, one of the similarities that, that maybe that I'm, I'm imposing is the idea about a certain kind of vision for the organization that these leaders have, whether it's um, at ways about engaging in strategy, organizational objectives, composition of the, of the various organizations that people might be leaders in. And so I think the, the similarities that I see with people, at least with the two figures that we're talking about, um, is, a, is a perhaps um, uh, having a unique vision around what an organization should be doing, how it should be run, what it should be making as, as its objectives. In terms of what it means for racial justice, I mean, it, again, it's tricky. I think then it depends on, I think the leadership skills of the specific person involved. If they're very good, then presumably the various institutions would benefit from their leadership. If they're not, they're not. There's always a the concern that people might be stretched thin and not giving their attention to, um, given their attention to the specific needs of the organization and the constituents that they represent. Um, 
So it's hard to say. I think there's one story that says very charismatic, effective, and efficient leaders who run, who are in leadership positions in a variety of organizations, that that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, you know, we have, in the context of the legal profession, we have more lawyers. So there's another story that, say, that says, you know, perhaps um, leadership positions might be divvied up more equitably. So that, that would be my guess, um, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not fully sure. Professor Mack, did you want to weigh in or can I go to the next question? I think, you know, I think Sean, you know, delivered a, a fairly thorough answer. Okay, cool. Uh, Adam Shilton. Uh, thanks, Latoya. Thanks everyone for this. Um, I missed the earlier sessions today, so I might be asking a question that's uh, in parts retreading on earlier ground. But one thing that I was struck by in both presentations uh, was the thick social networks uh, that existed. Um, and I had heard, you know, I was aware of the, many of the highlights of, for instance, Dickerson's career, but um, particularly in Sean's presentation, it became clear how many bar associations, fraternities, organizations that clearly were a big part of um, Dickerson's life, and I assume professional success being, uh, you know, part of um, these robust networks. And the thing that it brought to mind, um, contempor uh, the contemporary thing that brought to mind to me was the Federalist Society, where the conservative legal movement has been extremely effective at networking and then leveraging those networks to get people into uh, judicial nominees, uh, nominations or other career, um, career benefits. Uh, and it just made me think on whether or not um, on the left or whether among progressive lawyers and among black lawyers and uh, various other uh, communities that perhaps that um, uh, there might be room to be, to focus more on just simply networking, creating organizations socialization um, uh, and whether or not that might be possible. So I guess the question is something like, um, has the, the you know, bowling alone of society in general led to a decrease in these kinds of connections? And if so, should that be sort of a, a, key, a key take lesson from the legacy of, of someone like Dickerson is that we should be fighting to get that back to um, help create career opportunities? Sorry, end of question uh, or thought. <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I can take a stab at it. I guess the, the, the answer is certainly yes, as a general proposition. Um, you know, but to take the kind of Robert Putnam, you know, framework, you know, there were, there, there was a, there were a lot of things that sustained these social networks that uh, Dickerson was in. I mean, it wasn't just the network, it was the segregation of the society it was the great migration out of the South. It was a need to create black institutions in a world which, where black people were, were segregated from other institutions. It was, it was a lot of things. And, um, you know, and I guess if you were kind of gonna take the William Julius Wilson framework, you'd say that, it, you know, you know, the community got divided, people moved out, integration happened. We don't have all of those things anymore. Now, if we wanted to think about an analogy to something like um, the, the Federalist Society, um, it seems to me the Federalist Society certainly was facilitated by the fact that its members found themselves to be outsiders who needed to create their own network. Now, it became something else over time, but there was something more than the network um, that created and sustained the network. So if we want to think about a liberal network, we'd have to think something about more than the network that creates and sustains the network. More than the network could be <laughs> political victories, right? If you could offer your members judgeships, you know, it facilitates the ability to get them to join in. You know, there, there are all these things that they created, but, but you have to think about all those things that sustain the network. Um, that would be my lesson that I would derive from Dickerson. Perfectly captured better than I could, so. Um, so uh, we have one minute. Um, I think Professor Fairley maybe can give us a little bit more um, insight on Jewel, um, just to kind of round that out, that discussion about, she was the first uh, African-American to, uh, first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School. 
Yes, absolutely. So uh, Jewel LaFontaine, yeah, so she's a graduate of the law school. I believe she graduated in the mid 40s. She started her career as a trial lawyer and legal aid, uh, but then she soon after uh, created a law firm with her husband, John W. Rogers Sr., who was also a graduate of the law school. Now, John Rogers, uh, he was a former Tuskegee Airman and he went himself went on to an illustrious legal career as a jurist here in Cook County, Illinois. And the last part of his career, he was really focused on the juvenile justice system. But Jewel LaFontaine, she was um, she was an AUSA for the Northern District of Illinois. Um, but then she got into the political arena and she was a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1960. And she gave the seconding speech uh, for Nixon's nomination. She was the first black woman to argue before the, the United States Supreme Court. And it's my understanding that the case that she was arguing had something to do with laying the foundation for what ultimately was Miranda versus Arizona. Um, she then served in the, the Nixon and uh, Bush senior administrations in various capacities, including as the rep uh, a representative to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And of course, uh, towards the end of her career, she, she was also a very illustrious uh, corporate board member serving on board, boards of major US corporations, including TWA, uh, Revlon and Mobile Oil. So just to fill in some of the blanks there. Thank you very much. So this is the end of this panel. I wanna thank both Professor Osea Wusu and Professor Mack and all of you for engaging in this conversation. So I will hand it over again to Professor Farley for our final remarks. Well, thank you so much, Professor Clark. So here we are. Um, I wanna thank all the presenters from today for sharing their, their thoughtful uh, scholarship. And also to everybody who spent the time to be with us today. I hope you found it as meaningful and as energizing as, as I did. I mean, I knew that I was gonna learn new information today and I did. I was just, it was fantastic to, to hear about um, the background of Kappa Alpha Psi. My own father was a, was a Kappa. He joined the alumni chapter in Washington DC um, because he couldn't do it as, a, as an undergrad because he was one of the handful of, of black men at Dartmouth College back in the mid fifties. Um, so I knew that I was gonna learn a lot of new information and I knew that there was gonna be really great thought provoking discussion. Um, but I think what really surprised me was the extent to which setting aside this time to focus on this particular uniquely accomplished black man would be a kind of food for the soul, um, particularly at this moment where the fight for civil rights that he waged with such finesse and perseverance continues amain. So thanks to everybody. And I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Hubbard. Thank you, Professor Fairley. And I uh, just wanna take a moment uh, to second all of the uh, gratitude and praise uh, that Professor Fairley has expressed to each one of the presenters and the moderators and to all of the participants, all of you who have joined us uh, for this uh, conference today. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of, uh, of this event and, and this celebration of, of such an important and uh, an inspiring figure. I, I, I use that word advisedly and I'm going to use it again uh, it, it, before, I, before I finish my, uh, my closing remarks. So I'll just offer a couple minutes of, um, of, of my thoughts as I, as I tried to reflect about, this, uh, about this, this, this conference. I think today is an opportunity uh, to reflect on uh, the life and the legacy of Earl B. Dickerson. Professor Osei Owusu so nicely captured in his remarks as the, as the final speaker for today, all of the things that Earl Dickerson did in his career. He was a lawyer, he was a business person, he was a government leader, a civic leader. His career spanned the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, and the Civil Rights Movement. He founded uh, veterans organizations, uh, bar associations, chapters of Kappa Al Alpha Psi, as we talked about. He brought down racially restrictive covenants right here in the south side of Chicago, and he helped fight to integrate the defense industry during World War II. He was a member of the City Council of Chicago, CEO of one of the largest black owned life insurance companies in the United States. He led the National Lawyers Guild through the Red Scare 
and he mentored a generation of lawyers who carried the torch for the civil rights movement from the time of Hansberry versus Lee to the era of Brown versus Board of Education and, and beyond. It, it, it's, it's, it's so much, it's so much to, to think about and to try to take in. I guess to summarize it, you can just say that he was a lawyer for his age. And a hundred years ago, he graduated from, from law school, from the University of Chicago Law School. And today, a hundred years later in 2020, I think we can see him as a lawyer for our age as well. By the time he had finished law school, he had seen war overseas. He had witnessed riots and racial violence. And although we haven't mentioned it yet today, I feel the need to mention it now he had lived through a global pandemic that had killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States during the time uh, that he was uh, uh, returning from World War I and returning to school at the University of, of Chicago. So although it might seem trite to describe him as, as inspiring, I, I do feel like today, uh, in, in these times, in our times, uh, times that present adversity that in many ways seems eerily familiar, uh, would seem eerily familiar to the Earl Dickerson who was graduating from law school in 1920. I think of Earl Dickerson as a source of, of inspiration and, uh, and even I would say of hope and, and of solace uh, for all of us today. Uh, with that, I will, I will uh, turn it over to um, uh, Richard McAdams uh, for his closing remarks. Thank you, William. I, I, don't, uh, I, I can't really add to um, what's been said uh, about uh, Dickerson, especially I, I like what you, you, you added there that he survived the last uh, great global pandemic in addition to everything else. Uh, right before graduating in March of 1920. Uh, it's been a joy to get to know this uh, remarkable man um, a bit these past few years after uh, reading the biography, the material that our library collected and what the family graciously shared with us, and then further in this conference today. Um, I, I'm, I'm honored to be associated with an institution that gave Earl Dickerson his legal education and uh, something that he thought to remember towards the end of his life in that, that letter that the Dean uh, read from this morning. Um, the presentations and discussions have been at a very high level today. Uh, uh, one that is, uh, I think, um, uh, that Earl Dickerson deserved. Um, and they, uh, I think, have started to give Dickerson more of the attention that his, life work, his life's work deserves. I like that we were uh, uh, that Kenneth Mack was uh, and, and, and Sean were just talking about the possibility of more scholarship on Earl Dickerson. That seems like something that would be a great uh, thing if this uh, conference uh, in any way helped to make that um, happen. Um, let me uh, say uh, that we hope to see you all on April 17th of 2021, we'll, when we will reconvene for the second half of our delayed celebration of uh, Dickerson Centennial. And some thanks are in order for making this conference possible. I, I, the Dean, Tom Miles, has given unwavering support and uh, an introduction this morning, uh, which was excellent. I, I thank all the presenters and moderators, uh, my fellow members of the Centennial Organizing Committee, professors, uh, Fairly and, and Hubbard and the students Ariel Yoon and Adam Hassanain uh, and and thanks to Casey Lemchenko, our uh, director of events for uh, organizational assistance. Brianna Robinson helped design the logo we've been using for the centennial, and um, and thanks to the audience for uh, your time. Uh, let's let's uh, uh, be safe in the current pandemic, and if hopefully consistent with that vote. <laughs>